The housing crisis effect, housing crisis effect has been felt across the globe. From the little town in Finland that bought mortgage-backed securities and now has lost their money, to Washington, D.C., to Wall Street, to Main Street, and to the back street. Cleveland itself and its housing crisis and foreclosures have been particularly hard hit and was marvelously documented in the New York Times cover story in March. But I think it's important to note that while the effect has been felt almost everywhere, it has been particularly impacted on African-American neighborhoods and communities where they have, the, have had the greatest severity of foreclosures. The mortgage and housing crisis has affected almost everyone. The vast the majority of people who took out subprime and Alt-A loans were moderate and upper income white folks. But it also needs to be noted that the disproportionate impact of the subprime housing crisis has impacted African American borrowers and the result has been a generational loss of wealth and incredible devastation on the neighborhoods. And every advocacy and research and regulatory body has documented the disparity between the lendings of African Americans and whites regardless of race and also looking at the geographical impact. The connection between subprime lending and higher foreclosures was recognized as early as two the year 2000, when the HUD, Treasury Task, the HUD Treasury Task Force on Predatory Lending, which I served on, came out with a report that looked at the analysis of those correlations, subprime and foreclosures, in Atlanta, Chicago, and in other areas. The Ohio Reinvestment Coalition did excellent research and advocacy as early as 2002 and 2003, where they tracked subprime lending and foreclosures to find that there was a correlation and it's rising, even as unemployment decreased. In Durham, my hometown, regardless of income, African Americans received high cost loans at a rate of four to one to whites. And last year we did an analysis and found that 78% of the foreclosed homes had an African American occupant, almost twice the number of representation of the percent of African Americans in the home ownership population. The role of race and its consequences in lending and disparities and foreclosures was illustrated this Sunday in the New York Times when they did an article around the lawsuit against Wells Fargo for fair lending violations. In it, Wells Fargo employees described policies and incentives that targeted African Americans in neighborhoods for subprime loans. The language reportedly used by the employees was offensive and clearly lacked respect for others. The resulting devastation of the foreclosure crisis in the African American neighborhoods led the city of Durham, the, excuse me, the city of Baltimore to be the lead plaintiff against Wells Fargo. The article is most troubling for me not just because of the alleged actions of Wells Fargo, but, but that the lawsuit is coming from a municipality, Baltimore, not the federal regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction over Wells Fargo. The concerns that I've laid out have been well documented and presented over a long period of time. And yet, as an activist, I have failed to see a corresponding response by the federal regulators. Now the reason why I, I, in addition to just kind of being brought to this issue out of a sense of fairness, I bring this up as just a illustration of the, of the failures in our regulatory system and in the financial lending system. And there is a need for principled reforms. And these principled reforms are both for the financial institutions and for the regulators as we try to work our way through this crisis. As evidenced by the global credit crisis and the impact on local communities, in layman's terms, the system is broke. The issues we faced in 1968 are different and have changed, but they have similarities. The Kerner Report, following the 1967 um, urban riots, recognized that civil rights, housing and community development were all interrelated. That is still true today as evidenced by the central city neighborhoods facing significant foreclosures and abandoned homes, like in Cleveland, that were caused in part by the predatory lending and discriminatory lending. So what is old is new and what Aretha had was, still has a message for us in singing respect. We still need an anthem around our civil rights movements and housing. So let's talk about solutions since we've clearly underscored the problem. Financial regulatory reform is imperative. Yet we have a difficult time, at least I do, perhaps you do, around getting our hands around key aspects of it because the complexity is enormous and the challenge is huge and because power of the decision makers is in relatively few hands. How do we as community folks, from banks to community development practitioners, have an impact on those policy decisions? 
Well, first, let me say I think it would be helpful if we had some basic principles to guide our actions by and our thoughts around how we debate regulatory reform rather than jive into any specific reform up front. So a group of nonprofits got together, drank a lot of coffee, and we came up with these, the principles that are in your folders, the attachment about principles for financial reform. And this is a fairly difficult process, even of like-minded people, to be able to articulate what is it that we believe need to be guiding our actions in the future. Let me just hit some highlights, and you can read it as well later. Basic responsibility. The financial, offer, financial institutions must offer products and services that are appropriate and suitable to the needs and abilities of the borrowers. Accountability. Financial institu institutions must refrain from and be a, held accountable for offering harmful financial products and services. Transparency. Regulators must dis demand transparency from institutions, and the regulators need to be transparent themselves about their role in regulating financial institutions. The current black box that regulators are not allowed to talk about how they regulate is a basic undermining of our democratic principles and holding ourselves accountable to the populace. The regulatory institutions need to be more transparent. Avoid the conflicts of interest. Financial institutions must avoid conflicts with other financial players and regulators that undermine the integrity and independence of decisions. We no longer need financial institutions to be paying the rating institutions on the quality of the bonds that they're selling on the secondary market. People, am I talking to you? Can I get a little amen from the crowd? Thank you very much. Avoid systemic risk. Now here's an idea. Policy and re regulators must implement changes in their oversight policies based on the reality that financial institutions that are too big to fail may be too big to exist. And if not, I appreciate the comment that then let's recognize the fact that we're on the hook for it and pay for it up front. One of the two. Equal access from my original and main point. Regulators must monitor whether all persons and communities have equal access to mainstream financial products and services and hold institutions accountable by vigorously enforcing non-discrimination laws. Those were the principles that California Reinvestment Coalition, Woodstock Institute, NEDAP in New York, and my organization came up with. You know what? I challenge you to come up with your own principles. Take these as a basis. Go ahead and mark them up. Give them to me at the end of the thing. Use them in your workshops. But we can't get to what our core policy recommendations are going to be if we can't agree on what our core principles are and the values that we're trying to embody in those reforms. All right, so let's say we've all agreed on what the principles should be for financial reform. Let me talk about three goals for our housing policy and what we'd like to see achieved. One, keep the credit markets liquid for building, buying, and selling homes and apartments. Fairly simple. Let me give you my two cents on the GSEs. I think the GSEs didn't cause the housing crisis and the credit market fell down, but I do think they contributed to it. I also think that because they kind of over lent and they over borrowed and their balance sheets couldn't cover what they were owed when the foreclosures came through, they're a lot like homeowners. They're stuck. I believe that the taking over of the institutions by the government was a necessary action. And while, they're in, while the federal government has control of them, they need to be instruments of our federal policy. We need to use them to increase, to maintain liquidity and to help manage the massive foreclosures that are going on through the loan modification program. In the short term, we can talk and brainstorm about what the future looks like, but there's not enough intellectual or political capital in hand to institute major reforms on the GSEs. They've got huge resources and competencies. We need to continue using those to work our way through the crisis as we plot and plan for the future. Second, we need to manage and mitigate the deleveraging of assets and the, and the foreclosure crisis. I'll argue that we continue collectively to have a failure of imagination on how bad the foreclosure crisis will impact our, our nation. We believe that the big corporations couldn't fail. We couldn't believe that America could have this many foreclosures. And yet, we're only in, we're not even halfway through the foreclosure crisis and look at the damage that it's done. We haven't disposed of those toxic assets yet. The problem is getting worse, and we need to not fail to imagine the future in a worse case and therefore fail to act substantively now. We need to expand our mitigation programs. 